Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org. The following material is copyrighted and may not be duplicated, reproduced, or redistributed without prior written consent from the Veritas Forum. Join us as we explore true life. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking the Veritas Forum for the privilege of taking part in tonight's important debate. Professor Anthony and I have uh, previously debated the question of God and morality in a book entitled God and Ethics. And so I'm happy to have the opportunity to continue our discussion this evening. Now the question before us this evening is, is God necessary for morality? Notice what the question is not asking. We are not asking whether belief in God is necessary for morality. No one in tonight's debate is arguing that in order to live a moral life, you have to believe in God. Rather, the question is whether God is necessary for morality. The answer to that question obviously depends on what you mean by morality. If by morality you mean simply a certain pattern of social behavior prevalent among human beings, then obviously that sort of behavior could still go on, even if it turned out that God does not exist. God isn't necessary in order for human beings to exhibit certain patterns of social behavior which they call acting morally. But if by morality you mean that certain things are really good or evil, that certain actions are unconditionally obligatory or impermissible, then many atheists and theists alike agree that God is indeed necessary for morality. In the absence of God, morality turns out to be just a human illusion. The same Patterns of social behavior might go on without God, but it would be a delusion to think that uh, such behavior has any objective moral significance. Accordingly, in tonight's debate, I'm going to argue that God is necessary for morality in at least three distinct ways. Without God, objective moral values, moral duties, and moral accountability would not exist. So let's look at that first point together. If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And I said that when we talk about moral values, we're talking about whether something is good or evil. Now, to say that there are objective moral values is to say that things are good and evil independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. So to say, for example, that the Holocaust was objectively evil is to say that it was evil even though the Nazis who carried it out thought that it was good. And it would still have been evil, even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in brainwashing or exterminating everybody who disagreed with them so that everybody thought the Holocaust was good. My first claim is that if there is no God, then moral values are not objective in that sense. Traditionally, objective moral values have been based in God, who is the highest good. He is the locus and the paradigm of moral value. God's own holy and loving nature supplies the absolute standard against which all actions are measured. He is, by nature, loving, kind, generous, faithful, uh, just, and so forth. And thus, if God exists, objective moral values exist. But if God does not exist, what basis remains for objective moral values? In particular, why think that human beings would still have moral worth? On the atheistic view, human beings are just accidental byproducts of nature, which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe in which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social 
conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, Homo sapiens, <coughs> exhibit similar behavior for precisely the same reason. As a result of socio-biological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality, which is useful in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about Homo sapiens that makes this morality objectively true. Philosopher of science Michael Roos reports, the position of the modern evolutionist is that humans have an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. If we were to rewind the film of human evolution back to the beginning and start anew, people with a very different set of moral values might well have evolved. As Darwin himself wrote in The Descent of Man, if men were reared under precisely the same conditions as bees, there can hardly be a doubt that our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. For us to think that human beings are special and our morality objectively true is to succumb to the temptation to speciesism, an unjustifiable bias in favor of our own species. The objective worthlessness of human beings on a naturalistic worldview is underscored by two implications of that worldview, materialism and determinism. Naturalists are typically materialists or physicalists who regard man as merely an animal organism. But if man has no immaterial aspect to his being, uh, whether you call it soul or mind or whatever, then we're not qualitatively different from other animal species. On a materialistic anthropology, there's no reason to think that human beings are objectively more valuable than rats. When a terrorist bomb rips through a market in Baghdad, all that really happens is just a rearrangement of the molecules that used to be a little girl. Secondly, if there is no mind distinct from the brain, then everything we think and do is determined by the input of our five senses and our genetic makeup. There is no personal agent who freely decides to do something. But without freedom, none of our choices is morally significant. They're like the jerks of a puppet's limbs, controlled by the strings of sensory input and physical constitution. And what moral value does a puppet or its movements have? Richard Dawkins' assessment of human worth may be depressing, but why, on atheism, is he mistaken when he says, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for being. If there is no God, then any basis for regarding the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens as objectively true seems to have been removed. Take God out of the picture, and all you seem to be left with is an ape-like creature on a tiny speck of dust beset with delusions of moral grandeur. Second, if God does not exist, objective moral duties do not exist. Duties have to do with whether something is right or wrong. Now, you might think at first that the distinction between right and wrong is the same as the distinction between good and evil. But if you think about it, you can see that this isn't the case. Duty 
has to do with moral obligation, with what I ought or ought not to do. But obviously, you're not morally obligated to do something just because it would be good for you to do it. For example, it would be good for you to become a doctor. But you're not morally obligated to become a doctor. After all, it would also be good for you to become a firefighter or a homemaker or a diplomat, but you can't do them all. So there's a difference between moral values and moral duties. Now my claim is that if God does not exist, then we have no objective moral duties. To say that we have objective moral duties is, again, to say that we have moral obligations regardless of whether we think that we do. Traditionally, our moral duties were thought to spring from God's commandments, such as the Ten Commandments. Far from being arbitrary, these commandments flow from God's very nature. On this foundation, we can affirm the objective rightness of love, generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality, and condemn as objectively wrong selfishness, hatred, abuse, oppression, and discrimination. But if there is no God, then what basis remains for objective moral duties? On the atheistic view, human beings are just animals, and animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a lion kills a zebra, it kills the zebra, but it does not murder the zebra. When a great white shark forcibly copulates with a female, it forcibly copulates with her, but it doesn't rape her. For none of these things has any moral dimension. They are neither prohibited nor obligatory. So if God does not exist, why think that we have any moral obligations to do anything? Who or what imposes these moral obligations upon us? Where do they come from? It's very hard to see why they would be anything more than subjective impressions arising and ingrained into us by societal and parental conditioning. On the atheistic view, certain actions such as rape and incest may not be biologically and socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development have become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to show that rape and incest is really wrong. Such behavior goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. On the atheistic view, the rapist who goes against the herd morality is doing nothing more serious than acting unfashionably, like the man who belches loudly at the dinner table. If there is no moral lawgiver, then there is no objective moral law which we must obey. Thirdly, if God does not exist, then there is no basis for moral accountability. Traditionally, it's been held that God holds all persons morally accountable for their actions. Despite the inequalities of this life, in the end, the scales of God's justice will be balanced. Thus, the moral choices we make in this life are infused with an eternal significance. But if God does not exist, then what basis remains for moral accountability? Even if there were objective moral values and duties under atheism, they seem to be irrelevant because there's no moral accountability. If life ends at the grave, it ultimately makes no difference whether you live as a Stalin or as a Mother Teresa. As the Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky rightly said, if there is no immortality, then all things are permitted. Given the finality of death, it really does not matter how you live. The state torturers in communist prisons in the Soviet Union understood this all too well. Richard Gombrandt reports, the cruelty of atheism is hard to believe when man has no faith in the reward of good or the punishment of evil. There is no reason to be human. There is no restraint from the depths of evil which is in man. The communist torturers often said, there is no God, no hereafter, no punishment for evil. We can do what we wish. I have heard one torturer even say, I thank God in whom I don't believe that I have lived to this hour when I can express all the evil in my heart. He expressed it in unbelievable brutality and torture 
inflicted on prisoners. But given the finality of death, it really does not matter how you live. So what do you say to someone who concludes that we may as well just live as we please, out of pure self-interest? You might say that it's in our best self-interest to adopt a moral lifestyle. But clearly, that's not always true. We all know situations in which morality runs smack dab in the face of self-interest. Moreover, if one is sufficiently powerful, like a Ferdinand Marcos or a Papa Doc Duvalier or even a Donald Trump, then one can pretty much ignore the dictates of conscience and safely live in self-indulgence. Historian Stuart C. Easton sums it up well when he writes, there is no objective reason why man should be moral unless morality pays off in his social life or makes him feel good. There is no objective reason why man should do anything save for the pleasure it affords him. To believe then that God does not exist and that there is thus no moral accountability would be quite literally demoralizing. For then we'd have to accept that our moral choices are ultimately insignificant since both our fate and that of the universe are ultimately the same regardless of what we do. By demoralization, I mean a deterioration of moral motivation. It's hard to do the right thing when it conflicts with your own self-interest. And it's hard to resist temptation to do wrong when desire is strong. And the belief that ultimately it does not matter what you choose or do is apt to sap one's moral strength and so undermine one's moral life. As Robert Adams observes, having to regard it as very likely that the history of the universe will not be good on the whole, no matter what one does, seems apt to induce a cynical sense of futility about the moral life, undermining one's moral resolve and one's interest in moral considerations. The absence of moral accountability from a philosophy of atheism thus makes an ethic of compassion and self-sacrifice a hollow abstraction. In sum, it's plausible that without God there are no objective moral values, no objective moral duties, and no moral accountability. God is therefore vitally necessary for morality. As I said, this is a conclusion that is accepted by a good many atheist philosophers, such as Nietzsche, Russell, and Sartre. Though the conclusion is a painful one, these thinkers believe that honesty compels them to face it squarely. The challenge confronting an atheist philosopher who, like Professor Antony, continues to cling to objective moral values and duties after letting go of God is therefore threefold. First, to explain what is the basis of objective moral values on atheism, in particular what is the basis for the intrinsic value of human beings. Second, to explain what is the source of objective moral duties on atheism, what makes certain acts obligatory or forbidden if there is no moral lawgiver to command or forbid them. And third, to explain how on atheism ultimate moral accountability exists or alternatively why it is not necessary for morality. Well, I'm really happy to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to discuss this really important and I think fascinating question with Dr. Craig and with all of you. And thanks very much to Don Lentz and the Veritas Forum for setting this up and to Dr. Craig for agreeing to participate in this conversation with me. And I also have to thank all of my friends uh, who have been uh, helping me think about this. I hope Dr. Craig had the benefit of uh, similar support. Um, I hope that we can make some real progress tonight, progress in understanding the nature of moral value. The question before us tonight is whether God is necessary for morality. Now you might think that this is a question that must necessarily divide theists from atheists, that if you believe in God, you must believe that God is the source of, or the ground of morality, and that if you don't believe in God, then you must believe that morality is independent of God. But this is incorrect. Many atheists agree with Dr. Craig that God is necessary for morality, and they infer from this and their premise that God doesn't exist, that there is no morality, no objective right or wrong. Dr. Craig quoted some of these atheists to you tonight. So atheists can agree with theists that God and morality go together. On the other hand, and this might be surprising to some of you, many theists, like many atheists, believe that God is not necessary for morality. 
and that what is right is right independently of God's existence. So the position that I'm going to defend is a position that is a perfectly acceptable position for religious people to adopt. Indeed, I'm going to argue that my position on this issue is a more pious position than Dr. Craig's, a better position for theists to hold. If God exists and is perfectly good, then I contend that my position is the position that God wants his creatures to adopt. The reason is that it only if morality is independent of God that we can make moral sense out of religious worship. It's only if morality is independent of God that any of us can have a moral basis for adhering to God's commands. Dr. Craig's position can give us, at best, self-interested reasons for obeying God. It's Dr. Craig's position, not mine, that's destructive of morality. But let me back up. Um, maybe some people are surprised just to learn that atheists ever believe, or that they can believe, that there are objective moral truths, that there are really moral obligations or moral virtues. I gather that some people think that it simply follows from atheism that there is no right or wrong, that if God, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. But this does not follow. I am an atheist, and I believe that some things are morally right and some things are morally wrong. Now, where's the contradiction? I believe, for example, that it's wrong to drive people from their homes or to kill them because you want their land. I believe that it's wrong to enslave people. I believe that it's wrong to torture prisoners of war. I also believe that if one sees any of these things going on, one has a sober moral obligation to try to stop them. But do I think these matters are objective? Yes, in at least three senses of objective. And it's actually a complicated philosophical issue, exactly what it is to be objective. But here are three senses that are fairly standard. First, I think that whether something is right or wrong, oh, I should say, Dr. Craig and I think, uh, Dr. Craig and I, I think, agree on this completely. First, I think that whether something is right or wrong does not depend on human attitudes toward it. In this respect, moral judgments are true or false in just the way non-moral judgments are, by corresponding or failing to correspond with the way the world is. So I hold the claim that slavery is wrong is not at all like the claim that chocolate is delicious. That claim simply expresses my attitude toward chocolate, which is extremely positive, by the way. <laughs> the judgment that slavery is wrong is rather like the claim that chocolate contains antioxidants. That's a claim about the way the world is about, sorry, that's a claim about the way the world is, and specifically about how chocolate is. Objectivity in this sense also means that the moral facts are as they are independently of humans, human beings' knowledge of them. We can be ignorant of moral facts, and we can make mistakes about them. Some people think that abortion is morally permissible, and others deny that it is. Someone here is making a mistake. Someone's right and someone's wrong. Notice in contrast that when I say chocolate is delicious and you say no it isn't, we aren't really disagreeing about the objective features of chocolate. We are simply expressing contrary attitudes toward us. Neither of us is making a mistake. Well, I take it back. Chocolate just is delicious. There's a second sense of objective in which I think moral facts are objective, and that is that they're independent of human will. It is not up to us to decide what is right and what is wrong, in the way it is up to us to decide what the rules of baseball will be or what the traffic laws will be. We can decide what it is for someone to be a good baseball player, we can lay those conditions down, but not what it is to be a good person. Third, I hold that morality is objective in the sense of being universal. I am not a relativist. The fundamental moral facts do not change from culture to culture, nor does the fact that one's culture condones something make that thing in any way morally right. In the examples that I've given above, I deliberately chose things that were historically or are currently regarded as morally permissible within my own culture. And I'm going to try in what follows to keep my examples to real life cases, things that are, that are facing us now. I don't care if these things are regarded as morally permissible by some people. I repudiate them. Slavery is wrong, torture is wrong, even if the laws of one's country permit it. Now, what Dr. Craig needs to show is that none of these specific moral judgments nor these claims about the nature of moral judgments in general can be true unless God exists. And that seems to me to be a remarkable claim. If God turned out not to exist, then slavery would be okay? 
there'd be nothing wrong with torture? What could possibly make someone believe that? The only answer to this question that I can think of is that God is what makes moral facts true. That the things that are morally good are the things that God has commanded or endorsed, and they're good because he commanded or endorsed them. This theory is called divine command theory. Divine command theory would explain certain things about the objectivity of morality. Because God exists independently of human beings and their attitudes, his commands do too. We didn't invent God, so we didn't invent morality. We can be ignorant of God's will, and hence mistaken about what is morally good. And because God is omnipresent and eternal, his commands apply to all, place, all people at all times in all places. That's all fine. It would follow from divine command theory that moral facts are objective. The problem is it wouldn't follow that they are moral. The argument for this claim is an ancient one due to Plato. In his dialogue, Euthyphro, the title character tries to explain his conception of piety to Socrates. The pious acts, Euthyphro explains, are those which are loved by the gods. But Socrates finds this definition ambiguous and asks Euthyphro, are the pious acts pious because they are loved by the gods? Or are the pious acts loved by the gods because they are pious? Now, what's the difference? Well, if the first reading is correct, then it's the gods loving those particular acts that makes them count as pious acts, that grounds their piousness. Pious on this alternative is just shorthand for something the gods love. Whatever the gods happen to love, bingo, that's pious. If the gods change their preference, preferences on a whim, and they did if Homer knew his stuff, then the things that are pious change right along with them. In contrast, on the second reading, pious acts are presumed to have a substantive property in common, a property in virtue of which the gods love them, a property that explains why the gods love them. Now, translated into contemporary terms, the question Socrates is asking is this. Are morally good actions morally good simply in virtue of the fact that God favors them? Or does God favor them because they are, independently of his favoring them, morally good? Divine command theory corresponds to the first option. It says it's the mere fact that God favors them that makes morally, things, morally good things morally good. Now, theories that endorse the second option, let's call that any such theory a divine independence theory, these theories contend on the contrary, that the goodness of an action is a feature that is independent of and antecedent to, that predates God's willing it. God could have commanded either this action or the opposite, but in fact, he chooses the good one. Both divine command theories and divine independence theories entail that there's going to be a perfect correspondence between the class of actions that God commands on the one hand and the class of actions that are good, or rather they do if you add the assumption that God is perfectly benevolent. The two theories differ, however, on what accounts for this congruence. Divine command theory says it's God's command that explains why the acts are good, why the good acts are good. It becomes true merely by definition that God commands good actions. Goodness on this view becomes an empty honorific. It has no independent content. Divine independence theories, on the other hand, say that it is a substantive property of the acts, their goodness, that explains why God commanded them. I go even further and say that it's the goodness of the things that God chooses that makes God good. God is good in virtue of choosing only the morally good things. Now, divine independence theory presumes that we have an independent <coughs> grasp of ethical facts and that we can use that grasp to predict and understand what God will prefer. Now, it's, a pr it's hard to appreciate just how radical and bizarre divine command theory really is. Divine command theory makes the claim God commands the good into a mere definitional tautology, like bachelors are unmarried. This makes for really appalling consequences from an intuitive moral point of view. Divine command theory entails that anything at all could be good or right or wrong. And I'm making this funny gesture with, uh, to indicate quotation marks to indicate what we call scare quotes, to indicate that I'm using these words with the strange meanings they would have if divine command theory were true. If God were com to command you to eat your children, then it would be right to, it would be right to eat your children. 
The consequences are also appalling from a religious point of view because divine command theory implies that we can have no moral reason for obeying God's commands. It may be that we have prudential reasons for doing so, self-interested reasons for doing so. God is extremely powerful and so can make us suffer if we disobey him. But the same can be said of tyrants, and we have no moral obligation, speaking now in ordinary terms, to obey tyrants. We might even have a moral obligation to disobey tyrants. The same goes for worshiping God. We might find it in our interest to flatter or placate such a powerful person, but there could be no way in which God was deserving of praise or tribute. <coughs> now, defenders of divine command theory are going to object that God could not, or at least would not, issue any such command. The reason is, they'll say, that God's nature is essentially good. And this fact is also supposed to explain why we ought to obey God and why we should worship him. But the reply misses the point. What is it about good, about God, that makes him good? God's moral properties do not follow from his natural powers, his omnipotence or his omniscience, nor do they follow from the fact that he created the universe or even that he created us. It is certainly conceivable that the creator of the universe was a powerful, intelligent tyrant who issues commands of his own. If the term good is not just an empty epithet that we attach to the creator, who or whatever that turns out to be, then it must be that the facts about what is good are independent of the other facts about God. If good is to have normative force, it must be something that we can understand independently of what is commanded by some powerful, omnipresent being. Another thing that defenders of, of divine command theory might say is that we can infer that God is good by looking at the kinds of things that he has, in fact, commanded. Now, I actually think this is a slightly dangerous strategy since there's at least some textual evidence that God has commanded some pretty bad things, but I'll say more about that in a minute. God's commands, they say, show that God loves his creatures and commands only what is good for them. But this reply also misses the point. Either the words love and good in this context have non-normative meanings, as in, I love animals, I think they're delicious, in which case we again would have no moral basis for obeying God, or the words love and good have normative meanings, in which case we've once again presupposed that we can make sense of what is objectively good independently of what God commands. In short, it has to be God's goodness that gives us a reason to obey him or to worship him, and not the mere fact that he exists. But then goodness has to be a substantive property and not an empty formal term that is defined as just whatever way God happens to be. Now, as a matter of fact, I doubt that there are many religious people who really believe divine command theory. If there were, then there would be fewer interpretive difficulties surrounding those stories in the Bible that depict God commanding things we would ordinarily regard as moral atrocities. So what, everyone would say, if God orders genocide, as he does at Samuel 15, 1 through 3, or if he commands a father to slaughter his son? God commanded it, so it's good. But of course, this is not the attitude that most religious people take toward these stories. Most people struggle to make sense of them in light of the clear moral fact that killing innocent children is wrong. Indeed, ordering a parent to kill an innocent child is wrong, even if you don't intend to let him go through with it. If these acts are wrong and God is good, then there must be some mistake. We must be misinterpreting. God must not really have commanded these things, or we must be wrong about what it is that he actually did command. Now, for this sort of interpretive practice to make sense, It must be that we have an antecedent grasp. We already know, before we read about God's commands, what moral rightness is. In all of these cases, reflective and morally responsible religious people find reason to reject surface readings of scripture and other authoritative texts when such texts appear to attribute to God edicts that conflict with common sense morality. But if divine command theory is true, If there's nothing to moral goodness than God's preferences, then there can be no rationale for seeking alternative readings of morally troubling texts. There can be nothing morally troubling about an endorsement of slavery or a command to vigilante violence or to genocide because, according to divine command theory, there's no moral standard independently of God's will. 
It is only if, and I repeat myself, moral goodness is a property independent of and explicative of God's will that it makes any sense to question reports of apparently immoral commands of God. In short, God's existence is not only not necessary for morality, it is not enough. God must also be good. For the claim that God is good to mean anything, the good must be independent of God. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. And so in the second round now, we'll have um, presentations of 10 minutes each, and we will begin with Dr. Craig. Now, this is still working, right? Okay, good. Well, thank you, Dr. Anthony, for your very stimulating comments. I think that we're in for a good exchange tonight. Now, you'll recall that at the end of my opening speech, I invited you to listen carefully to how Dr. Anthony would address three fundamental questions. If God does not exist, what is the basis for objective moral values, moral duties, and moral accountability? Did you notice that Dr. Anthony did not address any of those issues in her opening statement? Nothing that she said gives us any clue as to what sort of positive account she would give of the basis for moral values, moral duties, and moral accountability on atheism. What she did instead was to go on the offensive and argue that moral values cannot depend upon God. They must be independent. Either that the good is something that is arbitrarily willed by God, or that the good is something that exists independently of God. Rather, the view that I defended in my opening speech is the view that traditionally theists have taken, namely, that God wills something because he is good. That is to say, what Plato called the good just is the moral nature of God himself. God is by nature, loving, kind, impartial, fair, just, and so on. He is the paradigm of goodness, and therefore the good is not independent of God. Moreover, God's commandments are a necessary expression of his moral nature. His commands to us are therefore not arbitrary, but are necessary reflections of his character. And therefore, it makes no sense to ask, if God were to command us to eat our children, would it be right to eat our children? Because this proposition has an impossible antecedent and therefore no non-trivial truth value. It's like wondering, if there were a square circle, would its area be the square of one of its sides? The question just has no meaningful answer because it's logically incoherent. Now, Dr. Anthony has some intimation of this third alternative, for she recognizes that theists will say that God's nature is essentially good. Well, that's not exactly the point. Rather, the point is that God's nature determines what is good. She objects to this view because then we would have no understanding of what it means to say that God is good. She says, for the claim that God is good to mean anything, the good must be independent of God. This objection, I think, embodies an important confusion. Let me first state what the confusion is and then explain it. Dr. Anthony is confusing, I think, moral ontology with moral semantics. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the discipline of moral philosophy is subdivided into a number of different fields. For example, moral semantics studies the meaning of moral terms and sentences. Moral epistemology studies how we come to a knowledge of moral truths. Moral ontology studies the metaphysics of morals, their foundation in reality. Now, when we say that the good is grounded in God, this is an ontological claim about moral values foundation in reality. It is not a semantical claim about the meaning of the word good. So I agree completely with Dr. Anthony that semantically goodness is not, as she puts it, an empty formal term that is defined as just whatever way God is. I concur wholeheartedly 
that the word good must, as she says, be something that we can understand independently of what is commanded by a powerful omnipresent being. Theists typically maintain that God is the ontological foundation of moral values, and without him, objective values would not exist. But theists do not maintain the implausible, semantical thesis that the word good means anything like commanded by God. The Euthyphro argument is thus a false dilemma and therefore logically invalid. It does nothing to show that moral values cannot be grounded in God. God's own nature determines what is good and his nature expresses itself toward us in the form of divine commands which then constitute our moral duties. It is this alternative that Dr. Antony must show to be impossible, not straw men like God's inventing arbitrarily the good or the good's being something to which God is subservient outside of himself. Now, without the linchpin of the Euthyphro argument, Dr. Antony's case for objective morality without God collapses. She must then give some positive account uh, to those three questions I've posed. So I want to return to those questions to review the challenge confronting the atheist. First, if God does not exist, why think that objective moral values would exist? As we saw, in the absence of God, there's no reason to think that the herd morality evolved by various human societies is objectively true. Dr. Anthony seems incredulous. She says, if God turned out not to exist, then slavery would be okay. There'd be nothing wrong with torture. What could possibly make someone believe that? Well, the answer is that on a naturalistic worldview, human beings are just animals. And activity that counts as slavery and torture is common and natural in the animal kingdom and amoral. Ants, for example, enslave uh, aphids to labor in the depths of the anthill where they're imprisoned for life. If ants were endowed with rationality, then ant morality would consider slavery to be morally just. Remember Darwin's illustration of human beings raised under the conditions like beehives. As for torture, have you ever seen an ordinary house cat toying with a mouse until it finally bores of the sport and kills it? If there isn't any God, then what makes slavery and torture among human beings uniquely evil? How do these strange, non-natural, moral properties come to supervene upon the members and actions of our species? This question is especially pressing when we recall those two implications of naturalism, namely materialism and determinism. It's impossible that something that is essentially a puppet or a machine can have a moral dimension to its actions. Secondly, if God does not exist, why think that we have any objective moral obligations or prohibitions? The problem here for the atheist, I think, is very easy to see. If there isn't anybody to command or prohibit certain actions, then how can we have moral obligations and prohibitions? All Dr. Antony had to say on this point is, I am an atheist and I believe that some things are morally right and some things are morally wrong. Where's the contradiction? Well, the problem isn't that there's a contradiction, but rather that there's no basis on the atheistic worldview for the affirmation that some things are right and some are wrong. It's as if the atheist were to say, I am an atheist and I believe that chocolate is objectively delicious and vanilla is objectively revolting. Where's the contradiction? The problem again isn't that it's self-contradictory, but rather that it makes an objective assertion without any basis in reality. Finally, on atheism, there just is no moral accountability, ultimately. As the philosopher Immanuel Kant recognized, God is a necessary postulate of moral reason, for only he can guarantee that happiness will be proportioned to virtue, um, as it ought to be. And morality is fundamentally vain if this fundamental ought is unsatisfied. On atheism, morality is ultimately futile and inconsequential. So, in summary then, I think that the Euthyphro argument is logically invalid and therefore fails to prove that moral values exist independently of God. On the contrary, I think it's very plausible that on atheism there are no objective moral values, moral duties, or moral accountability. 
And therefore, I think we have every reason to think that God is vitally necessary to morality. Thank you, Dr. Craig. And now 10 minutes from Dr. Anthony. Okay. Um, well, as I expected, Dr. Craig has reported to you that there are many atheists who agree with him that without God there'd be no morality. This is absolutely correct. It's also absolutely irrelevant to the topic of the debate. I'm an atheist who believes that there are objective moral truths. I think Michael Ruse is wrong. I think Richard Dawkins is wrong. I think that, um, and by the way, Russell, I think, did believe that there were objective moral truths. He spent months in a, a prison in, in Great Britain. Um, uh, because he refused to pay war taxes for a war over one that he thought was immoral. What Dr. Craig needs to show is there's something wrong with my position, and he can't do that just by noting that there are people who disagree with me. What Dr. Craig needs to show is that nihilism, the view that there's no objective moral value, follows from atheism. I haven't seen any argument for that. Well, there's one argument, but it's full of confusions. Dr. Craig says that atheists must believe that human beings are, quote, just animals, and that since, quote, animals have no moral obligations toward each other, it follows on the atheist view that human beings have no moral obligations toward each other. And there are two separate fallacies here. First is that it doesn't follow from X is an animal, that X is only an animal. That is, that X has no properties other than those properties X has in virtue of being an animal. This, doesn't, this inference doesn't even hold for, pardon the expression, Animals. My dog is an animal, but she isn't only an animal. She's many other things. She has many other properties. She has the property of being a pet. She has a psychological property, the property of being loyal. Human beings have lots of properties beyond their biological properties, and lots of properties that other, human, that other animals lack. We're different from other animals. We have the capacity to make plans, to value beauty, and to reflect on our own behavior. These are morally important properties properties that make us morally valuable creatures and that generate moral obligations. Now, Dr. Craig commits this fallacy repeatedly. It doesn't follow from the fact that we are made of molecules, that we are only molecules. There are collections of molecules and there are collections of molecules. Some of the collections of molecules constitute inert objects like rocks, but some constitute living, sentient beings, beings with hopes and fears and beliefs and values. Those collections of molecules, because they also have these other properties, are morally important. But the point is simple. What matters to the kind of thing you are is not what you're made of. We're all made of the same stuff, ultimately. But rather, how the stuff you're made of is put together, how it's organized or formed. What's the difference between a piece of copper wire and a copper coin? Not the stuff they're composed of. It's copper in both cases. We can even imagine that the very same lump of copper was, be, was fashioned first into wire, then melted down and fashioned into a coin. The whole field of organic chemistry exists because there are many substances that have very different properties, even though they have the same chemical formulas, like orthobutane and isobutane, both C4H10. These isomers differ, isomers differ not in the kinds or, uh, or numbers of molecules that compose them, but in the way those molecules are arranged. Now, the arrangement of molecules needed to compose a human being is extraordinarily complex, and it gives rise to creatures that have brains and nervous systems that bestow upon them capacities for consciousness, self-consciousness, rational thought, for sympathy, and for a sense of justice, for a capacity to recognize these very same capacities in other creatures. Ants don't have that. Zebras don't have that. Sharks don't have that. Creatures who have these capacities are creatures of surpassing moral value. No atheist and no materialist has to accept that if a child is killed by a bomb, quote, all that happens is a rearrangement of the molecules that used to be a little girl. Second, second fallacy. Dr. Crane's argument is either invalid or question begging, depending on what he means when he says animals have no moral obligations. If he means that some animals have no moral obligations, then the argument is invalid. It has the same form as this one. Some animals cannot talk. Human beings are animals. Therefore, human beings cannot talk. On the other hand, if he means no animals have moral obligations toward each other, then the argument begs the question. It assumes the thing it's supposed to be proving. If human beings are at least animals, 
then there are animals that have moral obligations toward each other, namely us. Now, third, although it's true of most animals, this is something that's misleading, it's not a fa uh, fallacy. Although it's true of most animals that they possess no moral obligations, this is misleading if you think that um, animals have no moral significance at all. Many animals have the capacity to feel pain. And that means that we human beings who recognize the fact that they can feel pain and who can appreciate the moral significance of the fact that a creature can, can feel pain, we have moral obligations toward those animals. Okay, let me talk a little bit about the basis of morality. Dr. Craig says that I must explain the basis of objective moral value on atheism and that I must explain what the source of objective moral duties are. Well, I don't have that obligation, and I, we're probably going to play burden of proof volleyball here a little bit, but I can have good grounds for rejecting an answer to a question, even if I don't have any other answer to offer. Consider the question of the origins of life on Earth. Some people think that life was brought here by benevolent aliens. Now, I can have good reasons for thinking that this theory is wrong without knowing how life did originate. I don't have a clue. Dr. Craig's theory about the basis of moral truth is not a good theory. That's what the Euthyphro argument shows. It shows that God's mere existence is insufficient to ground moral obligation. You need not for God just to exist. You need for God independently to be good. So I can reject Dr. Craig's theory even if I have no other theory to offer. That said, I think I may be able to answer Dr. Craig's question anyway or his challenge. If he wants to know what about the world makes it true that, for example, it's wrong to cheat poor people, I can tell him. It's the objective wrongness of cheating poor people. If he wants an explanation of why this is wrong, I can tell him that too. It's wrong because it's unjust. It's wrong because it causes needless suffering. Those are observation facts. They're obviously true. And they're facts whether or not God exists, and they're sufficient to explain why those actions are wrong. Now, it is wrong to kill innocent children with bombs in order to achieve a political goal. And it's wrong, by the way, whether this is done by a stateless radical or by the president of the most powerful country in the world. Such a thing is wrong because the child is innocent, because it will cause the child to suffer, because it will cause anguish to the child's loved ones, and for countless other reasons as well. All of these reasons would exist even if God did not. I'll go further. If God exists and is good, then if you ask him why he forbade us from doing these things, I bet he'd cite exactly the same reasons. There's something objectively true about such actions that explains why God forbade them. What the Euthyphro argument shows is that either God's commands are arbitrary, in which case we have no moral obligation to obey them, or they're not, and God has reasons for commanding what he commands. But if God is responding to reasons when he issues his commands, then the reasons have to exist independently of him and antecedently to his commands. Okay, what makes moral obligations... Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, what makes moral obligations obligatory? Dr. Craig thinks that there are no moral obligations unless there's someone there to impose them. That seems to me to be an extraordinary claim. I don't know whether or not, according to Dr. Craig, God commanded us not to torture animals. It's not in the Ten Commandments anyway. But it's certainly and obviously wrong to torture animals. Maybe the idea is supposed to be that without laws given by a lawgiver, it would neither be moral nor immoral to torture animals, and that seems just as obviously false. Dr. Craig's making an additional claim, and that is that human beings cannot distinguish between what some authority commands and genuine moral obligations but they can and they do from a very early age. Psychologist Elliot Turiel has shown that children between the ages of three and four recognize that moral rules have force independently of any particular authority. Larry Nucci has shown that even children and adolescents raised in strict religious traditions, Orthodox Judaism, Catholicism, Calvinist Dutch Reform, distinguish morality from religious authority. Listen to Marsha, a nine-and-a-half-year-old Jewish girl, interviewer. Suppose that God had written in the Torah that Jews should steal. God commanded all Jews to steal. Would it be okay then for Jews to steal? Marsha, no. Interviewer, why not? Marsha, because they know. They have a brain. They know it's really bothering the person they take it from. We all know. We all have a brain. Accountability. I find this section really bizarre. 
Dr. Craig criticizes those atheists who think that there's nothing to morality but naked self-interest, and then tells us there's nothing to morality but naked self-interest. Dr. Craig can't see that anyone would have any reason to behave in the ways we call moral if they had no fear of eternal damnation nor any hope of eternal reward. Now, I agree that if you believed you were going to be punished in some afterlife for things you did in this one, that would structure your incentives. It structures your incentives. Can I go on another half a minute? Uh, it structures your incentives to learn that Tony Soprano would like you to hire his son-in-law. That doesn't give you a moral reason to do what he wants, only a self-interested one. In contrast, I see and hear every day of people who do what's right, who make sacrifices, who put their lives at risk, not because they expect to be rewarded for it, not because they're confident their causes will triumph, it's because they believe passionately that what they are doing is right. Dr. Craig says even if there were objective moral values and duties under atheism, they seem to be irrelevant because there's no moral accountability. Irrelevant to what? Not to what I ought to do. Is Dr. Craig dismissing the avowed motives of people who do good things and say, I just wanted to help. I did it because it was the right thing to do. I don't see what's puzzling or irrelevant about wanting to help or wanting a loved one to flourish. Not unless one really thinks that goodness and evil are unintelligible, except in the context of a quasi-contract made with a tyrant, where the notions turn out to be synonymous with what will keep me out of trouble and what will get me into trouble. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. In our third round, we'll, we'll reduce the time down to eight minutes, and we'll go back to Dr. Craig. Before I look at the specific arguments again this evening, let me review the general logic of what's been said tonight. Dr. Anthony, I do not think, is able to provide us a basis on atheism for thinking that human beings have objective moral value, objective moral duties, or moral accountability. But her claim is that she doesn't need to do that because she has this euthyphro argument which shows that moral values cannot depend upon God. And that's why, as I said, this argument is the linchpin in her case. If that goes, the whole case collapses. Now, she has not dealt with my third alternative to the youth pro argument. The youth pro argument is simply a false dilemma. The good is neither something arbitrarily invented by God nor something to which God is subservient. Rather, the good just is the nature of God himself and expresses itself toward us in the form of his divine commands. This provides a logically coherent basis for objective moral values, duties, and moral accountability. The only response she gave in her last speech was to say that children from the very earliest ages are able to recognize moral values and moral duties without any training. Sure, this is ingrained into us by biological uh, evolution as well as parental conditioning. Steven Pinker who is a psychologist at Harvard University in an article in January of this year, has written the following. He says, the scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world. The tastiness of fruit and the foulness of carrion, the scariness of heights and the prettiness of flowers are features of our common nervous system. And if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem, or we're missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe that it is any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful to us? Pinker has no solution to this problem and therefore adopts a non-objectivist view of morality. Now, Dr. Anthony rightly finds that view morally abhorrent, as do I. But the question is, why on atheism, why on naturalism is Pinker wrong and Dr. Anthony right? It seems to me that her commitment to objective moral values and duties, which I applaud, is simply a faith commitment. It's a faith commitment of a naturalist for which the naturalist worldview provides no ontological foundation. What I'm offering is not a different set of moral values, but a foundation for those moral values that we both hold dear and, uh, and cherish, but which is lacking on the naturalistic worldview. Take the question of whether objective moral values would exist in the absence of God. We saw 
that there isn't on naturalism any basis for affirming the intrinsic value of human beings as opposed to other species. She says, well, I think Dawkins and Roos and others are, are wrong. Well, right, but why are they wrong rather than Dr. Anthony? She says, well, human beings have more properties than just being animals. They have lots of different properties, some of which are morally significant. Well, now, I agree, they certainly do have moral properties, but that's not the question. The question is, why would they have moral properties if there were no God? She says, well, human beings are very complex organisms. They have a self-consciousness and rationality. Fine, but why does that invest them with moral value? Why does that make them morally valuable? Take your example of the copper wire and the copper coin. The copper coin has all sorts of different properties in the copper wire, but intrinsically and objectively, the copper coin has no more value than the copper wire. It's a, it's a social convention of human beings that we use the coins for valuable currency. But intrinsically, it's no more valuable than if we use seashells for coins. It's a subjective viewpoint of human beings. And the question is, why isn't uh, morality like that on an atheistic view? Why think that creatures that have self-consciousness and rationality are uh, inherently valuable? Indeed, we saw that if the evolutionary conditions were different, creatures like us might have evolved quite different sorts of rationality, or rather not rationality, but of, of morality. Moreover, what about human beings that lack self-consciousness or uh, rationality? What about the, those in a, in a coma or uh, unconscious or mentally retarded? Uh, there's no moral basis for their intrinsic human worth on this proposal that Dr. Anthony offers. So given especially the determinism and the physicalism of the atheistic view, I can't see any reason to think that this particular species has the sort of objective value that she imagines us to have. Secondly, without God, why think that there are any objective moral duties? She says, well, it's wrong to do certain things because it causes suffering. But why is it wrong to cause suffering to members of the human species? Of course, we think that's wrong. But if there were uh, intelligent uh, guinea pigs or, or ants or other species, they would think their morality was objective. I don't see any reason to think that causing suffering to members of the human species is something that is uh, objectively wrong on atheism. Um, I, I just don't see any basis for this on a naturalistic worldview. Indeed, as Michael Roos points out in his very interesting article, Is Rape Wrong on Andromeda? We can easily imagine a race of extraterrestrial beings who are rational persons with self-consciousness for whom rape would not be morally wrong. He says, although the immorality of rape is a human constant, we cannot thereby assume that it will be a constant for other organisms, including extraterrestrial intelligent organisms. Certainly, if we look elsewhere in the animal world, we see that acts which look very much like rape occur on a regular basis, and indeed he says there are good biological reasons for why this occurs in the animal kingdom. So again, it just seems to me that Dr. Anthony is guilty of an unjustified bias toward our own species. Finally, without God, there is no moral accountability. She says that Craig is looking for a self-interested reason to be moral. He's not giving you a moral reason to obey. On the contrary, on the theory of ethics that I'm defending, we do have moral reasons to obey God because God is the ultimate good. His commands to us are therefore right, and therefore we have a moral obligation to obey God. But the advantage that I'm offering is that on the theistic-based ethics, moral choices are significant. They make a difference. They have a, a, a consequence to them that makes them ultimately meaningful, whereas on the atheistic view, Ultimately, mankind and all of us are doomed to perish in the heat death of the universe. Ultimately, it does not matter whether we live morally or not. It makes no ultimate difference to the final outcome or our fate. And therefore, morality becomes ultimately empty and futile on atheism. In other words, prudential interests run contrary to moral interests often on atheism. But on theism, prudential value and moral value can coincide and run together. And if they were to conflict, uh, it, the, the, the moral interest will trump prudential interests, and indeed it ultimately will be in your prudential interest to, uh, to obey God in the long run. So I think that theism offers both uh, prudential value as well as moral value, whereas 
on atheism, there, there simply is no, uh, no ultimate significance and, and final value to acting morally. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm puzzled by the contention of Dr. Craig that on his view, moral choices are significant and make a difference, and on my view, they're not. Uh, I, I just don't see what the argument for that claim is. I think it makes an enormous difference. It makes an enormous difference to sentient creatures all over the planet, what we choose to do about global warming. I think it makes an extraordinary difference to sentient creatures all over the planet, um, uh, whether, whether we continue a war or not. Um, I don't understand what more objective basis there could be for the prohibition against causing needless suffering than the fact that there are creatures on this planet that are capable of suffering. I don't see any more fundamental explanation possible than that. Um, let me say just a little bit about, uh, more about the accountability business. I, I still get the feeling, Dr. Craig says that it's an advantage of his view that the prudential and the moral reasons can coincide. Well, he's worked it out so that they always coincide. Um, boy, that's not my experience of things. My experience of things is that sometimes it's very hard to be moral, to be, to be moral, to do what's right. And the choices of people who, who decide to do that are all the more admirable uh, because it's difficult. Um, as for the unjustified bias against, uh, bias for our own species, I have no bias for our own species. Uh, I made a point of saying that we have obligations toward other species. It's not, it's not what your phylogeny is. It's not wh what evolutionary um, uh, branch you came off of. It's your characteristics. Are you the kind of creature that's capable of feeling pain? If you're the kind of creature that feels pain on Andromeda, and if you have the rational capacity to recognize that you're dealing with a creature that feels pain on an Andromeda, you will see rationally that you ought not to cause that creature pain, that that would be wrong. Um, now, one thing that I think Dr. Craig continues to confuse when he talks about evolution is the question of where did our moral sensibility come from? Where did we get this capacity to recognize moral facts? That's a very interesting question. I think some evolutionary psychologists have some interesting things to say. I think they, they uh, have some um, wrong ideas about things. But it's a very interesting question. It's not the same question as what makes it right or wrong. Um, it's, I think Michael, um, I think Darwin's speculation is, is hyperbolic. He imagines us raised in beehives, but are we like bees? If we're like bees, we don't have much in the way of a brain. If we're like bees, most of our brain is devoted to finding honey and uh, finding nectar and communicating that to the rest of our hive mates. But if, if we were human beings and we lived in a hive life situation, that would be a social form that might dictate different kinds of, of responsibilities. We might have different conceptions of property rights and so forth but there would still be some fundamental facts. We're sentient creatures, and we have the capacity to recognize that there are other sentient creatures on the planet. That generates the obligation to not cause needless suffering. Um, okay, now this business about providing a basis for morality. We are gonna play burden of proof volleyball here. The claim is that I cannot provide an objective basis for morality. An objective basis for morality would be a fact about the world that is true independently of what human beings believe about the world and that is true universally across the planet, okay? There are plenty of such objective facts. The most important one, I think, for grounding morality is the fact of sentience, the fact that there are creatures that feel pain. Another fact that's very important is that there are creatures who have goals, who can set ends for themselves. Once you have creatures who can set ends for themselves, then you've got creatures who have a right to pursue those ends. That's what makes it the case that you should not interfere with people's liberty um, unless you have a very good reason. And then finally, the capacity of, uh, the rational capacity that we have to understand these facts about each other. Now, what Dr. Craig has to show is that if God didn't exist, none of those facts would make any difference. It's one thing to say, here's another possible basis for morality. We could have a perfectly good being in the universe who issues commands. That's one possible basis. He has to show that my basis is inadequate. He hasn't shown that. All he said is that the basis that I'm talking about is a basis, these are facts that evolve through some natural process. Why does that make them not facts? I don't understand. 
He says they could have evolved differently. They could have turned out differently. It's true. We might not have been sentient, right? That would, that would, it would not change the moral fact that if we encountered any sentient creatures, we ought to not cause them pain. It wouldn't change that conditional fact. It would change um, the, the actual facts about how we, uh, how we could treat each other. Um, so I'm not a species. I think that any creature, that any creature, any device, right? If robots develop sentience, um, then we would have an obligation not to cause them pain. Any rational creature on the planet is a creature to whom we have certain kinds of, or, or sorry, in the universe, is a creature to whom we have um, uh, responsibilities. Let's see. Um, Okay, let me say something too about the, about the Euthyphro false dilemma. What, um, the point of the Euthyphro is to show that the mere existence of, certain, of, a, of, of a being that has uh, power, right, to, to command things, the mere existence of such a being is not enough. Now, I think Dr. Craig and I agree that what you need to add is that the being is good. But that's an objective moral fact that's independent of the other facts about the being. Now, you have two choices here. Um, and Dr. Craig is right to distinguish an ontological question from a semantic question, but they have implications for each other. You have two choices. You either say, I'm going to, I'm going to characterize a being, I'm going to point to that being, and I'm going to say, whatever the nature of that being is, that's what good is. Now, that's, that's the first euthyphronic interpretation. That says it doesn't matter what the objective facts are. It doesn't matter what that being likes. It doesn't matter what that being commands. Whatever the nature of that being is, that's good. Another way of saying it is, there is a being, and I'm going to look at the choices that being has made. I'm going to look at the, the commands that being issues. And on the basis of the characteristics of those commands and those choices, I will tell you whether it's a good being or not. Consider the following possibility. There is a universe that is created by a very powerful, very intelligent being. And this very powerful and intelligent being decides to populate the universe with uh, sentient creatures. And this, this being um, thinks that it would be terribly amusing to put these sentient creatures into really difficult situations. And he sees them wriggling around like flies, like a little kid who pulls flies off wings. He sees them wriggling around. This is just so amusing. This is so diverting. He's very, very pleased. Now, I think that we would all agree that that, that creator would be evil. Right? But the only thing different between that creator and Dr. Craig's God is the objective presence or absence of a moral property. Both of us have to say that there are fundamental moral facts. I say the moral facts are the facts that relate the conditions that generate obligations and the obligations. And that those very same facts are the facts that enable us to say with substance, and if you're religious, with piety and respect, that God is good. Thank you. We have one last round of five minutes each. <coughs> In my closing statement, let me try to draw together some of the threads of the debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, does the Euthyphro argument give any reason for thinking that moral values cannot be grounded in God? Well, I think not. Dr. Anthony admits that divine command theory does give an objective basis for values. Her initial argument was, however, that they wouldn't be moral in character. But if you think of who God is, God is the greatest conceivable being. God is a being which is worthy of worship. And therefore, God must be morally perfect and therefore morally good. Any being that is not worthy of worship, that is not the greatest conceivable being, cannot be God. And therefore, this meets the, the arbitrariness objection that she has when she says, whatever the nature of the being is, you just say that's good. The concept of God, I think, entails that God is morally perfect and, and is a being worthy of worship. So this gives us a ground for moral values that is both objective and moral. By contrast, I simply can't see why, on a naturalistic worldview, we should think that this primate 
creature that has evolved down here on the planet Earth, lost somewhere in the universe, is the source and locus of objective moral values rather than the victim of delusions of moral grandeur. First, without God, why think that human beings have objective moral value? All Dr. Anthony, I think, is able to say here is that it's simply wrong to cause pain and suffering to a rational, sentient creature, uh, and that's her stopping point. Well, I agree, yes, it is wrong, but what I can't understand is why you would think it would be wrong if atheism is true. It would be arbitrary, it seems to me, to pick those properties and invest them with goodness and uh, moral significance. There isn't any reason to think on atheism that those uh, properties of moral value or moral rightness would supervene upon this particular creature uh, or upon uh, properties of rationality and self-consciousness. She says, well, there's a difference between grasping moral values and the existence of moral values. I certainly think that's true. Even if the evolutionary account is true of how we come to grasp moral values, because they're grounded in God, I think that gives us objectivity. But what I can't see is why, on the atheistic view, moral values would be anything more than just these subjective illusions, which are the spin-off of the socio-biological evolutionary process. We can certainly imagine different moral values to have been produced by that same process, and it's hard to see why one set would be objectively true rather than the other. What about the second point, without God there are no objective moral duties? I think this is an especially weak point of atheism because the notion of obligation or prohibition requires someone to issue those imperatives. The notion of being obliged or forbidden to do something has by its very nature the notion of moral imperatives which are given to us. But on atheism there is no source of moral obligation or imperative. And she says, well, uh, there's simply nothing more fundamental than that pain ought not to be caused. Well, why? Pain is caused by other animal species all the time in the, in the animal world. Why is it wrong among human beings? She says, well, creatures that have the ability to set ends have the right to pursue those ends. Where did that come from? Where did that right come from? And why is it wrong to prohibit them? from uh, going after those ends on atheism. You don't have any source for moral duty or obligation on atheism because there is no moral law giver. Finally, without God there is no moral accountability. I think we agree on this point, that on atheism no one holds you morally accountable for what you do. My charge is that that makes morality empty uh, and vain. Ultimately, it makes no difference. She says, but of course it makes a difference to sentient life on Earth. Look at global warming. Look at the question of war. Those are nothing but short-term transitory changes that ultimately make no difference. Science tells us that ultimately, as the universe continues to expand, we will all perish in the heat death of the universe. Humanity, matter itself, light, heat, all will be extinguished in the final heat death of thermodynamic equilibrium. It is all futile and vain on the naturalistic worldview. So that ultimately it really makes no difference how you live. Moral values, moral duties become like shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. Your end is the same no matter what you do. By contrast, uh, theism I think is morally bracing because it gives us a sound foundation for morality which has consequences and therefore is not a vain and futile gesture in an empty and meaningless universe. Catholics make a distinction between two forms of remorse for your sins. You can have perfect or imperfect contrition. If you have perfect contrition, you're sorry because you, were, you did something wrong and you offended God. If you have imperfect contrition, you're only sorry because you're afraid of being punished. Um, it's okay if you have imperfect contrition, that will keep you out of hell. But perfect contrition, I was taught, was much better. Um, because it bespeaks the best possible motives for repentance, not fear of punishment, but hatred of sin and desire to do what's right. Now, as a young Catholic girl, I always felt that my own contrition fell short. No matter how hard I tried to focus on the inherent evil of my sins, I found myself thinking instead about what it might cost me later. How many days in purgatory is this worth? Tease the cat, it's worth it. Um, later when I was in college, I found my faith flagging, 
and I was struck by a perverse insight. The perfect contrition that had eluded me hitherto might finally be achieved if I became an atheist. If I didn't believe in God, then fear of eternal damnation could hardly be a reason for me to repent anything. If, as, if I, as a non-believer, felt bad for having done something wrong, it could only be because it was wrong. Much emboldened, I took my reasoning a step further. Maybe atheism was the only way to achieve perfect contrition, the only psychologically possible way for fallible, selfish human beings to put aside concerns for ourselves in confronting our misdeeds. And wouldn't a God who loved what was good be more pleased with creatures who sought what was good for its own sake than, for those, than with those who did so only to curry favor? Why, I said, did God prefer perfect to imperfect contrition? Disobedience clearly displeases God, but why? Is it the mere fact of disobedience? That didn't seem possible. God was not one of those petty tyrants like you encounter in school, teachers or principals who issue arbitrary commands and prohibitions just for the exercise, just for the delight of bending another person to their capricious wills. No, I concluded God wills what is right, only what is right, and prohibits only what is wrong. Disobedience offends because disobedience entails the commission of a crime. It's the right and wrong he cares about, not that he said, do it or not do it. It's the goodness, not the godness. Piety is doing what's pleasing to the gods. Doing good and being good. Surely what's most pleasing of all, then, is someone who does good because it is good, because she understands what the good is and because she values it for itself and not for the prizes it might bring. Atheists, if they commit themselves to justice, to peace, to the relief of suffering, can only be doing so out of love of the good. Atheists have the opportunity to practice perfect piety. Now, all that said, I want to close by conceding a couple of significant things to Dr. Craig. There are things that you lose when you give up belief in God. Morality is not one of them. I don't understand what better basis there could be for the duty not to cause pain than that there are creatures that suffer it and that it hurts. Nonetheless, you have morality, but here are some things you do have to give up. They're not insignificant. First, you lose the guarantee of redemption. Suppose you do something morally terrible, something for which you cannot make amends, something perhaps for which no human being could be expected to forgive you. I imagine that the promise made by many religions that God will forgive you if you're truly sorry, that that might bring enormous relief and comfort. You can't have that if you're an atheist. As a consequence, as an atheist, you must live your life and make your choices with the knowledge that every choice you make contributes in one way or another to the only value your life can have. Dr. Craig thinks that if atheism were true, human choices would be insignificant. I think just the reverse. I think they become surpassingly important. A second thing an atheist must relinquish is confidence that it will all work out in the end. Moral causes frequently seem to be lost causes. And it takes enormous courage and commitment to continue the struggle without any rational confidence that one's efforts will be rewarded. But it's a higher, more praiseworthy state of mind to be able to continue to act without promise of success, with only the comfort that one is doing what one can to make things better. The exhortation to keep faith, even in the face of the dark possibility that all will be lost, is, I think, a profound expression of confidence in the moral capacities and possibilities of human beings. The fact is that tragedy is possible. Human lives can be ruined. Civilizations can be destroyed. Nothing guarantees that these things will not occur. Nothing but our own limping, limited efforts. All we have is this world, this life, ourselves and each other, and it's up to us to make that be enough. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org.